Ara, Winter and Aroctus, Oxaguina Ushla, Fear Queen Fall to Rove, on Uderas or Mashnish, Agascoli Slainter, Quigan Shola Shaw, Shola Kaidan, Na Shunta, the Hervishi Konaha, the Lenny Agustini Foster, Le Mi Hamas. Mar Kahirlock, Eran Uderas, Big Misha, Mar Faran T, Agwiv Eg an Imacht in you. Is more vor an an ordom, go will na kaidan sha, a shola in you. Er lar deranak, ma hervish, mar karhirlak er an udarash, tereshdom ave partoklesh, le opt mlien gale. Ta anrod orum, ave in or mask, agas an laher, eg an shola sha in you. Minister, for the benefit of the small number of people who do not understand the first official language, with your permission, I'll continue in the second language. <laughs> um, minister, members of the Aractus, um, current and former members of the board of the authority, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to welcome you all here today on behalf of the Health Information and Quality Authority. Um, I will be acting as your MC, but you know what? Ask Wilga, isn't it much nicer? Farron T. <laughs> isn't it a lot more homely? So I'll try to be a good Farron T today. And um, it's a particularly proud day for me to be officiating at the launch of these new national standards because today is my last day as chairperson of the authority uh, after eight and a half years, two and a half years with the interim authority and six years with the statutory authority. And I have to say, I really couldn't choose a more important, a more vital um, event to officiate at on my final day. The statutory authority was established exactly six years ago. Tomorrow is our sixth birthday. And we have worked very hard to establish what I think is a rather unique approach towards driving improvements in the quality and safety of our health and social services. And the launch of these national standards for residential services for children and adults with disabilities is a hugely important milestone for us in the authority. We all know standards play a hugely valuable part in informing what people receiving services can expect and what is required of those providing services. This is never more so than when it comes to protecting the most vulnerable people in our society. These standards epitomize the overall approach of the authority, our absolute commitment to protecting people and our steadfastness in ensuring they are implemented. These standards will provide those who use the services and their families with a guide as to what they should expect from residential services. We believe that children and adults using residential services have the right to be safe, to receive good care and support, and to have access to the services they need to enable them to live a fulfilling life. So it gives me great pleasure to invite Mary Kyo Sullivan, the Director of Safety and Quality Improvement in the Authority, to speak to you. Mary Kyo Sullivan. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome, Minister. Welcome to all of you um, who are, at the end of the day, our very important stakeholders in this process and the people who will be responsible for implementing these standards for the benefit of all our adults and children living with disabilities. 
Um, these standards were developed, um, you, you'll hear us talking today very much about uh, the emphasis on uh, the, the transition that occurs between child to adolescence, to adult, to end of life, to older persons. Um, and we talk about that throughout the, the standards today and, and the, the, the recognition that we have that this is very, very important um, and also when we're dealing with people with disabilities. These standards have in essence also gone through a, a somewhat of a, a, a birth and all the way through to today. Um, they would have started off as the national quality standards for residential services for people with disabilities. Those were reviewed and then also the draft national quality standards for residential and foster care services for children and young people were also taken into account because they also dealt with children with disabilities. And we now have before us today the national standards for residential services for children and adults with disabilities. The purpose of these standards are to improve the quality of care for all people living with disabilities. Um, they have been developed very much in consultation with yourselves. I had an opportunity just earlier to meet some of you that have been involved in the development of these standards, along with Sinead McAvoy in my own office. And that is really important because you are the experts in this area. You are the people who deliver this care um, all of the, every single day. This is part of what you do. Um, and we also looked very much at the international evidence and the best practice um, internationally in terms of how people uh, treat people with, that, that have disabilities and how they care for them. Uh, there is a principles approach with this, and you will see us talk about the different principles as we go through the, uh, the different standards. And the scope of these standards are for all HSE uh, facilities or, H or those funded by the HSC that provide residential care to people with disabilities. There is a difference between standards and regulation, and Phelan will talk later on about when the monitoring of the standards um, takes place and the monitoring of your facilities. It will be done looking at both the regulations and the standards. Uh, the regulations are statutory instruments which are mandated under primary legislation, and they're designed to give effect to that legislation. The standards, which is what we're talking about here today, are person-centered, they're based on evidence and good practice, and their purpose, as I've said earlier, is to improve the quality of care. The way the, the standards are structured are in eight themes, and this is in alignment with all of the other standards that have been developed by the authority. Um, what we've done is we've, we've developed this wheel. There are eight key themes, and you will see that the themes that are on the top of the circle, um, the individualized support and care, the effective service, the safe service, and the health and development, those are evidence-based international standards for improving quality of care. The standards that you see underneath, the themes that are underneath, are around the capacity that we need and the capabilities that we need to have in the services in order to ensure that we're delivering that care that is, is discussed at the top. The principles that are embedded throughout these standards are those of rights, promoting the rights of people living with disabilities, promoting their quality of life in addition to, their, to the quantity of life, how long they live, how healthy they are, but very importantly, the quality of life is, is focused. They are person-centered. Now, whether that be child-centered or person-centered as, as the person grows older, but they're very much focused on the individual, promoting autonomy, equity, and participation. The first one of those themes then, I'm just going to go through the, each of the eight of them for you, is very much centered around individualized care. This idea that each one of us is, a, is different, and um, each person with disability is different. So we need to make sure that we are promoting patients' rights. We need to make sure that we are promoting their privacy and their dignity of all people living with disabilities. We need to promote their choice, that they do have a choice in the type of care that they receive, the types of supports that they have. We need to ensure that they are integrated into the community. We need to make sure that information is accessible to them so that they can make choices about what kind of supports they, they have available to them. And they need to be supported in decisions and in, in participating in their own decisions. And there needs to be an opportunity for them to complain and have those complaints listened to in the case that there is something that they wish to discuss. In order to have effective services, there is a need to have personalized plans, so individualized care plans for all of the children or adults in your care. These are our national standards, so part of that standard says that the care that we give to people needs to be individualized. 
These people live in your services, so we need to make sure that the services are as homely as possible, that people can access them fairly and equitably, and that any time that there is a transition in their care from one service to another, that all the services work together to ensure that that is done as smoothly as possible. We need to ensure that we have safe services. And safe services means that we protect people from neglect and from abuse. It also means that we support positive behaviour and emotional well-being. We need to ensure that our staff are trained in the area of risk. We need to be able to identify where the risks are and ensure that staff are trained so that they know how to manage risk, how to identify risk and how to manage those risks so that our clients, our service users, the people that are looking after our services, that are in our services rather, are being safely and, and are being protected. In the event of adverse incidents, we need to make sure that we investigate them thoroughly and that they are that the learning from those is shared across the services. And this is something that can be quite difficult at times, but it's very, very important that we don't repeat the same mistakes over and over again. In terms of promoting health and development, health promotion is a very important part of taking care of people that have disabilities. It's very important that they receive health assessments all the way through their life and that those health assessments are done in a timely manner and that following the assessments, the supports are put in place that people require. Medication management is a very high risk area. It's something that we need to have policies about. We need to make sure that medication management is something that has been discussed in each of the services and that there are good, solid policies in place to ensure that people understand how to manage their own medications if they can or that um, the, the medications are always managed in the safest way possible. We need to ensure that people with disabilities are given equal opportunities to education, to training and to employment. That goes back to our integrating into the community that we talked about at the beginning. In terms of leadership, governance and management, this is where your role is very, very important because in order to get all of those um, safe services in place and in order to promote the safety and the quality of the service that we've talked about, it is so important that you, as the leaders in this area, are meeting your legislative requirements, that you have clear accountability so that if there is an adverse incident and you do an investigation of it, that that is escalated up to the right place, that it is managed, and that something is done to make sure it doesn't happen again. We need to make sure that you have a clear statement of purpose. And this is to provide clarity to all the people working there. It's to provide clarity to parents of, of children that may be entering your services. It's also to provide a clarity to anybody in the public so that they know exactly what it is that you're doing within your service. Service level agreements need to be um, very concrete. They need to be very clear in terms of the service level agreements that you have with the agencies that are funding you. In this era in particular, we need to be very, very careful that we are using our resources in the best possible way. And that means planning our budgets, working within those budgets, identifying the services that you can deliver within the budget that you have. Um, and that's also about managing staff. And we come in then to the whole area of responsive workforce. And this is exactly as it says, it's a workforce that responds to the needs of the people that you have in your services that you're providing services for. This is about making sure that the recruitment procedures are absolutely embedded within the organisation, that you have good guard, the vetting, that you, again, it goes back to the protection, the safety, making sure that you're safeguarding these adults and children that are in your care. Staff competencies are very important to make sure that all staff have the knowledge, have the skills that they need to have in order to do the best work that they possibly can do. But staff also need to be supported. This can be an area that can be very high risk. It can be an area that can be um, very difficult for staff at times to deal with, and they need to be supported in the work that they do. And staff training is very, very important in that particular area as well. In particular, any kind of mandatory training that has to be done. 
use of information, that we use information properly, that the quality of the information is good, that we pass on, because communication is a key to good care. So making sure that the, the quality of the information that we pass on is good and that we are very careful with the confidentiality of that data as well. All of those things I just talked about were telling you what's in your standards that now need to be implemented. But you're not in this alone. The, the Safety and Quality Improvement Directorate within HICWA, along with the Regulation Director that Phelan is going to talk to you about in a minute, we're here to help you. And you will hear this in Phelan's talk when he talks about the fact that we're here to help, we're here to support. It's not just a stick to beat you with. So we are going to engage with all of you. We are going to ask you when you get a chance to look at these and review these standards, where do you need help? What kind of guidance do you need? We will then develop that targeted guidance. And it will, could be in the areas of, do you know how to do a risk register for your risk management process? Do you know what types of training is mandatory? And we'll give you two to three page guidance documents that will help you, but you will tell us what it is that you need and we will engage with you on that. Those guidelines that we give you will be based on evidence and best practice. They will be practical tools. They will not be 200-page documents. I guarantee it. They will be practical that you can use on the ground. And the whole emphasis on this is going to be supporting continuous quality improvement for all people living with disabilities. Thank you very much. I really look forward to working with you all. And I'm going to pass you on now to my colleague, Mr. Phelan Quinn, who is the Director of Regulation. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, Minister, uh, Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, just again, thank you for your attendance here today and uh, a very, very warm welcome to you all. Uh, today, I want to, uh, I suppose, outline the programme of work that the authority will embark upon to, I suppose, see the implementation of these standards, but also move us into uh, a programme of monitoring regulation uh, of services, uh, residential services to children and adults uh, with a disability. I think there are a number of key messages here today, and, and certainly Mari has talked about how these standards will set expectations for adults and children using these particular services. Uh, and I think the, these standards are primarily a, a tool for adults and children using the services for their families uh, to provide expectations on the quality and safety of those services and to ensure that those services enable everyone to live a fulfilling life uh, within residential care. The standards themselves also provide a framework for providers, and I think that's when we start to look at the monitoring program. The, the framework for providers means that today we formally hand over the standards to service users and to providers to assist them in driving improvement uh, within those services. HICWA has a very, very clear role in driving improvement within health and social care, as the Chairman has already articulated this morning. Uh, and the key issue here for us is that we need to acknowledge that alongside the drive for improvement from HICWA, there has been a very, very clear agenda within uh, the disability sector about driving quality and improvement within residential care. I'm conscious that over the number of years there have been accreditation programs and quality initiatives that have been supported by providers themselves, by umbrella bodies and by the HSC. And today I think marks the, the launch of a statutory framework against which we can see further improvement within those services. HICWA, HICWA within its uh, corporate plan are very, very clearly now articulating a number of strategic outcomes and I would like to frame today's uh, presentation under those uh, strategic outcomes. They are very clear, they're very important to us, and I believe they're important uh, to the public in Ireland. The first one is that care is improved, that people are informed, that people are safeguarded, and that policy and service decisions are informed. If we look at how care will be improved. Obviously, one of the first things that we will be doing as part of our regulation program is to register services. And that means that services, when registered, will have demonstrated that they meet the minimum standards and the regulations. And it is our aim to try to assist where possible 
all of the services out there that are subject to regulation to meet those registration standards and regulations. Obviously, as well, beyond that point, we will move into a program of monitoring and, and inspection. And there will be a clear focus uh, on improvement uh, within that program. We want to make sure that we assist providers drive improvements within the care and supports that they provide for adults and children. But similarly, we want to make sure that the care, being, uh, care and support being provided has a very, very clear focus on outcomes for children and adults, and that will be a very, very clear emphasis within our monitoring and inspection programme. We also wish to move towards a thematic approach beyond the point of registration, and we believe that by moving towards a thematic approach that we can incrementally achieve improvements alongside the providers of this care. And that will also be alongside the, the, the facilitated work that Mari talked about, the development of specific guidance against specific standards. Obviously, as well, we want to use the recommendations, the action plans, and, to, and in some instances, the sanctions available to us to drive improvements as well uh, in our inspection and monitoring programme. Our second outcome is that people are informed. And the first thing, I suppose, that will help inform people about services that meet the registration standards will be the register itself. And as services become registered and demonstrate that they meet the services, we will be able to demonstrate that through the public outface of that register. We will develop reports on the back of monitoring and inspection, and that will be reports on the basis of, of individual inspections of individual provider uh, centres, but also collective inspections, overview reports at the end of each uh, inspection year. We will and we want to continue to have strategic conversations, obviously with the Department of Health, uh, with the HSC, uh, and with the umbrella groups and, and uh, representative groups of, of providers and of service users. I think that's key to making sure that people are informed about what it is that we plan to do by way of our inspection programme, but also what our, our outcomes are. We have commenced uh, a series of roadshows to assist providers prepare themselves for the regulation programme, and those roadshows and other education events and clinics will happen over the course of the summer, into the autumn and winter, and beyond that if necessary to ensure that we get a smooth transition into the regulation of these services. Mary has already said that we will develop guidance, specific guidance, for those areas that, that uh, providers feel are necessary to assist them to achieve the standards. And we will also adapt a programme approach, and that's very, very much linked to the thematic and focused approach that I've talked about, making sure that services are very aware of what our programme of monitoring will be for any particular year, that there will be no surprises within that programme. I believe that conversations and constructive dialogue do not need to compromise our respective responsibilities. Certainly, HICWA will remain an independent authority in terms of its assessment, and I, again, I want to make sure that that is clearly articulated in the way in which we work in, collab in collaboration with each other. Our third outcome is that people are safeguarded. And there will be a very, very clear uh, emphasis from our perspective on public protection in the regulation of these services. And Mary has stated, you know, along the, the top of the wheel of these standards, we are using a rights-based approach. We want to make sure that the rights of all children and all adults using residential services are protected. There will be a very clear emphasis on an assessment of the safety of services, making sure that care and support is delivered in a safe and effective way. Uh, we will target our programme in line with best practice principles and regulation at services who pose the greatest risk. I would want to emphasise that you know, we do want to, to work uh, in, in an improvement mode, but I think reality is, is that sometimes we may encounter services that struggle to meet standards and at times also might see standards uh, for, for the safety and welfare uh, of uh, service users put at risk. So we will target our inspection resource at those services. We will use the legislation to promote improvement, and that includes the use of sanctions. However, again, 
we are hoping that through a collaborative approach we will be able to use our recommendations and action planning to deliver on improvement. And we will work with the statutory agencies as well to ensure that those who are most vulnerable in care are afforded protection. So we will work in partnership with those statutory agencies to make sure that that occurs. Our fourth and final outcome is that policy and service decisions are informed. And I've already said that we will be reporting and action planning at very, very local level with providers. And it's there that we hope to be able to influence the way in which standards are applied and that policy is developed at the most local level. But we also want to be able to make sure that we help you know, the HSC, the department, um, in, in the, de the delivery and development of national policy in relation to these services. So we will continue our liaison on the outcomes of our work in this regard uh, with the Department of Health, with the HSC and with the representative and umbrella groups. When we look at our monitoring and inspection programme, we hope to start before the end of 2013 a monitoring programme that I suppose monitors uh, compliance with these particular standards and as I've already said as well in line with best practice principles in, in regulation uh, we want to make sure that we as an authority are consistent in our approach that we are clearly articulating that approach in, an, in a transparent way with the providers of service but also with the users of service that we remain accountable as a public body in our delivery of that program that we are proportionate in the way in which we apply ourselves. So those services that demonstrate high levels of compliance, you know, we, we will not necessarily be applying ourselves in exactly the same way as those who pose significant risk. We will target, as I said, our services to those uh, who are posing greatest risk, and we will remain agile. We, we will have to remain agile around our ability to, to move around the system. The next steps, obviously today, the Minister is going to launch uh, these standards and they will be the mandated statutory framework against which monitoring will occur. I believe that services now need to take these standards today. It's, as I said, the formal handover to service users and uh, to providers and should maybe start a, a self-assessment process against these standards in preparation for registration and monitoring. HECWA will continue its programme of engagement with stakeholders uh, in advance of the commencement of the regulation of these services. And as Mari has articulated, we want to work collaboratively with you uh, in that engagement programme to make sure that we see a seamless transition into the regulation of these services. It's anticipated that the programme of registration will commence in September 2013. It is a, a challenging agenda, but I believe it's one that we're all up to. And the standards themselves will assist providers and those procuring services to build and to maintain effective, high-quality residential services for adults and children with a disability. Like Mary said, uh, I look forward as the Director of Regulation to working with providers of these services, but also with the representative groups of uh, children and adults using these services with the department, with the HSC and all of our other stakeholders. Thank you very, very much for your attention today. Now it gives me great pleasure to invite Kathleen Lynch, TD, Minister of State for Disability, Equality, Mental Health and Older People to launch the National Standards. Minister. Thank you very much, Pat, and uh, I know that Geraldine and Cullum uh, from the department uh, are here, so I feel obliged to bring the speech with me at least. <laughs> it's an excellent speech, it really is. Um, there'll be copies at the door. Uh, could I just thank Mary and Phelan and, um, and uh, Tracy and her entire team at HICWA and I, I, if, if the last uh, list of uh, what an organisation is about, uh, transparent, accountable, um, targeted but agile, uh, I think that 
clearly describes uh, HICWA. Uh, we passed a, a group of people on the way in who've been manning the stalls, and I think any organisation that can, on the one hand, produce regulations, do the inspections, and still man the stall on the day of the big event, uh, I, I think that's an organisation that works very well, and our deepest appreciation for that, because uh, there are a lot of people in Ireland that clearly uh, are thankful and not just to the work you do uh, on days like today, uh, but on the work, uh, for the work you do on an ongoing basis, uh, keeping our most vulnerable safe. And uh, for that, thank you very much. <laughs> Pat, it's his last event. Uh, I think it's not a bad event to go out on, Pat, I must admit. Um, you know, it's the sort of Alex, Alex uh, Ferguson moment. Uh, <laughs> Go out on a high. Um, we didn't bring the cup, but there you are. Uh, but uh, eight years, uh, eight years steering an organisation in transition at first, and then an organisation that I suppose was very challenging for society. Uh, and again, Pat, I know that you'll go on to do bigger and better things, but well done, and again, our deepest appreciation. Um, could, could I just say that uh, when, I, um, when I first got this job, um, I, I had a certain knowledge of disability and I suppose I had a certain personal knowledge in relation to mental health. Uh, I never thought that I would get older people and equality as well, even though I think as a woman equality is a given and I think that's why we get it. <laughs> but um, uh, when I did get it, uh, the first function that uh, I ever attended as minister, because I had been attending that function uh, for year, uh, years, uh, was in fact the AGM of Inclusion Ireland. And uh, Sean O'Rourke was the moderator on the day, and he said to me, um, OK, so what do you intend to do in disability? And I suppose as someone that always felt that, uh, you know, do one or two things well, and, uh, you know, that's, that's enough for anyone, uh, I rattled off... Um, uh, capacity legislation, standards, and individualised care. Well, we have the capacity legislation. It's not published yet, uh, but we do have it, and uh, we now have standards. I would have to tell you that in the intervening two years, the amount of people that said to me, we'll never see standards, we'll never see the capacity legislation, and I was beginning to doubt it myself. But when I met Tracy and her team last year, and uh, we started talking about standards and what they might look like and how we might manage to pay for it as well because there, is, there are staff implications here. Um, you know, I'm a great believer in, in uh, you know, not wasting a crisis and I think we had a crisis of some sort last year, Tracy, and sort of in the panic I went into the Taoiseach and I said if we don't get standards in relation to people with disability uh, in care, we're going to have the same crisis there and I think in that kind of panic uh, as, as politicians are the only people that can panic in that way. Oh, he said, you better have standards. And I said, I think we better. So <laughs> Tracy came in and we started to talk about it and we met Phelan. And, uh, you know, it, it, it just, you know, not snowballed, but very quickly, um, but very quickly um, began to become a realisation that it could happen. And when I look at things like this, um, I, I have a very old-fashioned view of how you should approach um, problems. I believe there's, there's a solution to every problem. I, I'm a great believer in that. May not be, you may not see that solution today, but there is eventually a solution to every problem. And Jenny O came in to me a few weeks ago uh, with their uh, annual report and the person I now keep in mind when I think about people with disability who are uh, in institutional care is Paul. And I don't want to expose Paul, but Paul is a man in his midlife uh, who had been in an institution for years. And everyone believe really didn't have capacity to make decisions about himself. But Paul is now living in the community with supports and did have capacity and knew exactly what he wanted and is very, very happy now. So, you know, we can talk about regulation, we can talk about institutions, we can talk about, uh, you know, uh, service providers, but really, 
we sh- the front of our minds, we should keep Paul. I mean, this is really what it's about. If I had a child that needed to be in these circumstances, what would I want? What would I want? And I think what I would want is an organisation that has both the flexibility, uh, the transparency and the agility to ensure that my loved one was safe and was having a life worth living. So, you know, we need to keep that in mind. And I know because I have met virtually all of the service providers around the country, and I know that all the majority of them provide that circumstance, you know, provide that environment, you know, provide that safe, loving care uh, to very vulnerable people. And I keep saying as well that, you know, service providers, and I'm not certain whether that's the right language, but then language always changes, um, service providers who were providing a service when the state did not provide it. We should be eternally grateful to them. But gratitude is no excuse for not moving on. And we need to move on. And we need to move on in a way that says that not alone are the needs of the people that we serve changing, but our attitude has to change. And more than anything else, it's about attitude. Oversight, ensuring that people are safe, are comfortable, and are living a life which they want to live is hugely important. The capacity legislation will force us to do that anyway. It will force us to do it. So we really need to be ahead of the curve and embrace, embrace what has been launched today. Embrace it. Look on it as a new challenge, as something that we are quite capable of doing because we've done it in other areas, quite capable of doing it. I was laughing at uh, one of the lines in Phelan's presentation where it had in brackets no surprises. In politics, we call that no ambushes. (laughs) But this is a partnership approach. A few weeks ago, when we were in the middle of a very um, tense argument in government, uh, where there were, and uh, the minister said to me, um, you know, this is not a dem and us, and I said it is, and dem's winning. <laughs> but this is not a dem and us. You know, this is a partnership approach which we all are determined will have the best possible outcome for the people that we serve, and we should never forget that. We should never forget that. It is the people that we serve deserve to be served well. And these regulations, these national standards, will ensure, will ensure that they are safe, comfortable, and they feel secure in the knowledge that they can express their own view. Secure in the knowledge that they can express their own view. Because I sometimes think that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. And we need to ensure that that does happen. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm absolutely... Uh, as now one of the three things that I promised to do is gone. I'm sure there will be someone come along and say, but now did you have a little bit of space on the list? You know, well, you know, I haven't a bit of space on the list. There are other things that need to be done as well. Uh, But this is one of the big ones. This is one of the good days. This is one of the positive days. And, you know, in circumstances where we're negotiating and asking people to voluntarily take pay cuts and that's never an easy thing because the country is in such a state that we need to bring it back on track there are few enough days like this and we need to embrace it and we need to accept that this is a very good day for everyone and I am so thrilled to be here Jack Straw once said during an interview and because First and foremost, I'm a politician. He was once asked by Jack Straw, uh, by David Frost, Minister, he said, you cannot legislate for attitudes. And he said, you're right, I can't. But I can legislate to ensure that your attitudes doesn't detrimentally affect him. So I think that's central to what we're doing. The attitude, the ability to change, and the ability to keep people safe whilst they being comfortable in expressing their views. I would like to congratulate HICWA. I mean that most sincerely. And above all else, there are people in this audience today who, and I say this respectfully, who are battering my ear about standards. 
battering my ear and to them I think this is your day as much as it is people in residential care. Thank you very much. Minister, sincere thanks on behalf of the Authority for the launch of the new national standards. And I see the lights are coming up a little bit. We have time for a few questions. The Minister has to get to the other end of the country the moment she leaves here. We're running a little bit be behind. We have a number of staff um, there at the back now with mics. And if you could please give your name and your affiliation and you can direct your question at the Minister, Mary or Phelan. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Um, just thank you, Minister, and thank you, Hikwish. Vaughan Kane from Inclusion Ireland. Uh, we warmly welcome the launch of today's standards. Um, it is, as you said, it's a milestone day and it's a, it's a great event. I just have two questions. One is with regard to when the regulations will be published and when inspections will start, or is there any timeline for that? And secondly, it was discussed about roadshows for service providers with, with regard to providing them with information. What is there a plan with regard to information provision for people using services and their families on how they can use the, serv how they can use the standards? Thank you. Siobhan, um, I, I'll answer the question in relation to the rollout and Phelan or Mary will answer the question in relation to how we're going to get the information out to people who, 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 who I suppose, who will be the biggest recipients uh, of all of this. Um, it is intended uh, that uh, we do, of course, have to put regulations in place, as you know, but we have near enough in terms of nursing home provision you know, there's, 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 a, there's a fair enough template there. It shouldn't take as long as, as the originals. Uh, it is intended uh, that in September uh, the inspections would start. Phelan. And just in, in relation to uh, your question about uh, children and adults using the service, uh, yes, we, we have um, commenced a program of communication with uh, service providers. Uh, we're very conscious that at the minute there are somewhere in the region of 1,800 service units uh, in Ireland, and we believe that that may uh, be brought down to about 1,300 designated centres. There are 10,000 service users, that's both uh, children and adults. Now, that's a significant challenge in relation to being able to communicate across the geography of the country. But we will look to see how it is that we can cascade information in an accessible way to service users over the course of the next few months. Uh, we have another question here. Um, and this lady in the second row would also like to ask a question. So we'll. Oh, no, no, if you proceed, please. I wasn't, I I wasn't didn't suggesting. I did not mean to take it. Um, my name is we'll Deirdre. get the mic back to you in a moment, yeah. sorry. My name is Deirdre Carroll. I was probably one of those people who was battering the minister's ears, both in and outside of government, and many more ministers prior to her. And I just want to make a comment, really, because to me this is a very, very important day. day. For me, personally, I formerly was in Cuse in Ireland, but I think I never thought the day I would see standards established because we've fought for over 20 years for them and we've had many setbacks on the road. So it is really so important that they are announced and to hear a very firm commitment that they're going to be implemented and implemented independently and nationally throughout the country. I have the highest respect for HICWA. I've seen the work that's been done in both children's services and in old people's services and the vast improvements that have occurred here. I have no doubt that this is going to be life-changing for many people living in disability services in this country. I know there are many other aspects of life that are important for people with disabilities, but I believe from my experience over 25 years working in this area that we've had a disability bill, we've had a national disability strategy, but none of them will do what standards will do for people with disabilities in the country. So I want to thank you personally, Minister. I want to thank the whole team in HICWA. And I'd also like to pay tribute to Marion Whitten, who was one of the first social service inspectors who, who helped really get this show on the road. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much, Deirdre. I suppose um, I was asked uh, a question uh, a few weeks ago about organisations that are funded by the state 
by whatever department and you know how can they be you know how can they possibly be independent and uh, you know what if they have something you know that the minister doesn't want to hear to report I take as I say a very old-fashioned view of politics I think if you have a job it is your duty you know whether the minister wants to hear it or not it is your duty to report when something goes wrong and I, I believe that looking at the history of HICWA, and it's a very short history, very short history, but the history of HICWA tells me that they will do this job as well as they have done it in all of the other areas that they're charged with. I have every confidence in them. Thank you, Minister. Now the gentleman who had Thank you, Minister. Uh, Eamon Tierney, St. Joseph's parents and friends. I think we probably know each other through email and through correspondence more than anything else. Great to see Deirdre here today as well. I'd like to thank, um, sorry, before I go into one or two questions, our small parents and, and friends group um, who very much su support everything that's going on here, here today. Uh, the first question th that I have uh, in my notes here was the, the date of implementation of inspections. Now, I think that's been clarified by yourself. You're talking, you're talking September. Uh, the next question I is, I mean, in these expansions, in these inspections, will HICWA have the teeth, let's say, of uh, HICWA, whereby you know they have got teeth, as we've seen in inspections of nursing homes? Are we talking about the same thing here? Yes, I, I mean the regulation uh, will be uh, will be, if you like, the piece that will will give Hick with the power, but yes, will be the same as as all other inspections. Okay, just another aspect um, of the the talks earlier on. I don't know whether it was it was mentioned, but um, about family involvement. Uh, I know in our consultation with Hickwa, that was that was very central to to you know through through the consultation. We're talking about quality of life here for the residents of intellectual disability facilities. And through that, the family involvement, we feel, must take place as well and must, must be taken heed of. Can I, I, ask Phelan to yeah. I, I would just, uh, Eamon, I would just want to say that as part of our uh, monitoring approach, our in inspection methodology, it would be our intention to make sure that we uh, receive the views of both the children and adults using the service but also uh, their, their significant others, their families, their carers, to make sure that we have a, a rounded view of, of the experience of service users as part of the inspection process. I believe that's most important if we're actually putting a focus on the outcomes for children and adults within the residential homes. Okay, and just lastly, the, the uh, recruitment process for inspectors, has that begun or where is that at the moment? Well, certainly we um, have commenced a program through uh, a redeployment process and we're hoping in the course of the next few weeks uh, to go out to external advert for additional positions as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have another question? I think at the back here, the, the mic has been handed to a person at the back. Uh, <coughs> Noel Howard from Social Care Ireland. This is a question really I suppose for Hikwa rather than the Minister. I know she's in a hurry and I appreciate that. Uh, one of the aspects that has come to our attention from a number of our members over the years in terms of the inspections of children's residential centres, and I'm sure it ties in with today's uh, launch uh, around the disability sector, and that is in view of what Mary has said about support and guidance. Some of our members would have found in the past that in terms of the inspections done by HICWA, that when, for example, they asked in terms of the recommendations or standards not being met, how should they go about ensuring that the recommendation was followed through or that the standard was met? They were told unequivocally that HICWA makes recommendations, they indicate whether the standards are met or not met, and that is their job. Now, in view of what Mary has said, do I detect a change in that attitude? I think there are two uh, components to the approach that we are proposing around not just the, the regulation of uh, residential disability service but also older per person services and that is that in order to drive improvement we must as well provide information to assist providers drive that improvement so the development of guidance and specific guidance along specific standards enables that to happen 
I've also said that there won't be any surprises, so to some extent we will as well set out a very, very clear agenda for our inspection programme. So again, that hopefully will help providers drive that agenda. I think at the point at which we actually make the assessment, there is a requirement for HICWA to identify whether or not there are any non-compliance issues. And those non-compliance issues will be based on the standards and on the guidance that has been provided. And it's at that point, yes, we will be making recommendations for improvement as part of the inspection process. And just to let you know, um, the Safety and Quality Improvement Directorate has just been established since July of last year with the sole purpose of doing exactly what you have just described. We develop standards, we, pr we develop guidance in association, in association with yourselves. We will also be developing um, other forms of help in the form of maybe on-site help. Um, so yes, there is going to be a change and it is very much going to be focused on uh, providing evidence-based guidance to people to help them to implement the standards. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take two more questions because the Minister will have to go, but our directors will remain on and can answer questions um, certainly for, a, for quite a while to come yet, and they can mix with you informally. So please. Chairman, uh, Minister, ladies and gentlemen, Tony McQuinn from the Citizens Information Board. And on behalf of the Board, I just want to welcome the new national standards for residential services for people with disabilities. And just to say that our role in supporting the National Advocacy Service for People with Disabilities uh, aligns very closely with the work of HICWA and we have 40 advocates around the country who are working with people with disabilities speaking on their behalf and they will find the new standards of enormous benefit to them in their work and obviously to the people with disabilities themselves. So it's a, it's a, it, as the Minister said, it is a very good day for the disability area for people with disabilities. Thank you. Who would like to ask the last question? Oh, there's, yes, sorry with the lights, it is a little bit difficult to see. Thank I always you. hate to miss an opportunity. <laughs> but I'm Frida Finlay and I'm uh, also a member of Inclusion Ireland and I'm really happy today because the work that Deirdre particularly and the present um, CEO Paddy Connolly have been doing on behalf of people with intellectual disabilities particularly to get these standards in place, um, it's, just, it's just a great day. I like the standards. I would have preferred if quality of life was in the centre there, um, but I am hoping that um, <coughs> there will be a certain amount of staff training to make sure that people are, people are allowed to make risks as well as making sure that no risks are taken, but also that they do an inventory of what's in local communities that is not just places and objects, but people as well, so that to ensure that people um, can have a better life within the community. Um, and I think a lot of staff training, uh, you know, new staff training would be needed to do that, as well as about health, teeth, feet, care, all those minute details I hope will come in under the inspection. Because, you know, the, the, if somebody has a corn, they can't walk, therefore they start opting out of um, activities. And they just say, I don't want to do it. And I think somehow, I don't know how inspection can manage that sort of inspection, but I think that's really important as well, that that will happen. Thank you, and thanks again. I think it just... Um Time to bring the formal proceedings to a close. Uh, Minister, I'll depart from the supplied script as well to say we're deeply honoured and grateful to you for coming along here today to launch these standards. Um, it's a huge day for the authority. And in fact, <coughs> we get into the news <coughs> more often than not for what I call the, the wrong reasons because of, <coughs> excuse me, because of adverse events in the health sector. And today is one of those, you said it, one of those good days because a lot of people think the only thing that HICWA does, the so-called watchdog, is go around like a Rottweiler. But in fact, what we get into the news for is usually only the tip of the iceberg. There is an enormous body of work going on every day, developing standards, meeting stakeholders, 
regulations, helping with development, and that's the real important work of the authority. And of course, look, things happen and we get into the news. But today is a really good news day, I think, for all of us here today. And I suppose, Minister, thank you. And I think, as Chairperson of the Authority, I have to finish by thanking our staff. I think they do that huge body of work behind the scenes, and we see here today the, the results of their work. And if you looked in your packs, you'll see you have the combined standards of adults and children, you have the separate standards for adults, the separate standards for children, you have the video, uh, there is a braille version available. Agus ta na caidán as gwaelga ar freshen ar an website. So we're trying to do our bit and I think they've been very innovative. And by the way, for people like me, for chairpersons of boards, they actually have a plain English version as well included in the pack. Uh, that was specifically for the likes of me. So, Minister, thank you for spending so much time with us and thank you for attending, all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending today. So I will bring, as far on tea, I will bring the proceedings to a close and I'm sure Phelan and Mary, um, are you happy to stay on the podium for a while to take any further questions if people wish? We can, we can, we're happy to do anything else. Or happy to mix and mingle. So maybe mix and mingle is probably the best thing to do from here on. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>